Section 16 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 9, European Statesmen, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. The Greek Revolution, Part 1. 1820 to 1828. When Napoleon was sent to St. Helena, the European nations breathed more freely, and it was the general expectation and desire that there would be no more wars. The civilized world was weary of strife and battlefields, and in the reaction which followed the general peace of 1815, the various states settled down into a state of dreamy repose. Not only were they weary of war, but they hated the agitation of those ideas which led to discontent and revolution. The policy of the governments of England, France, Germany, and Russia was pacific and conservative. There was a universal desire to recover wasted energies and develop national resources. Visions of military glory passed away for a time with the enjoyment of peace. Nations reflected on their follies and resolved to beat their swords into plowshares. Then began a period of philanthropy as well as of rest and reaction. Societies were organized, especially in England, to spread the Bible in all the lands, to send missionaries to the heathen, and proclaim peace and goodwill to all mankind. A new era seemed to dawn upon the world, marked by a desire to cultivate the arts, sciences, and literature, to develop industries, and improve social conditions. War was seen to be barbaric, demoralizing, and exhausting. Peace was hailed with an enthusiasm scarcely less than that which, for twenty years, had created military heroes. The Holy Alliance was not hypocritical. Although a political compact made under a religious pretext, it was formed by monarchs deeply impressed by the horrors of war, and by the necessity of establishing a new basis for the happiness of mankind on the principles of Christianity, when peace should be the law of nations. At the same time, it was formed no less to suppress those ideas which it was supposed led logically to rebellions and revolutions, and to disturb the reign of law, the security of established institutions, and the peaceful pursuit of ordinary avocations. This was the view taken by the Tsar Alexander, by Frederick William of Prussia, by Francis I of Austria, by Louis the Eighteenth of France, as well as by leading statesmen like Talleyrand, Nesselrode, Hardenberg, Chateaubriand, Metternich, Wellington, and Castlereagh. But these views were delusive. The world was simply weary of fighting. It was not impressed with a sense of the wickedness, but only of the inexpediency of war, except in case of great national dangers, or to gain what is dearest to enlightened people, personal liberty and constitutional government. Consequently, scarcely five years passed away after the fall of Napoleon before Europe was again disturbed by revolutionary passions. There were no international wars. On the whole, England, France, Russia, Prussia, and Austria put aside ambitious designs of further aggrandizement, and were disposed to keep peace with one another. And this desire lasted for a whole generation. But there were other countries in which the flames of insurrection broke out. The Spanish colonies of South America were impatient of the yoke of the mother country, and sought national independence, which they gained after a severe struggle. The disaffection in view of royal despotism reached Spain itself, and a revolution in that country dethroned the Bourbon king and was suppressed only by the aid of France. All Italy was convulsed by revolutionary ideas and passions growing out of the cruel despotism exercised by the various potentates who ruled that fair but unhappy country. Insurrections were violent in Naples, in Piedmont, and in the papal territories and were put down not by Italian princes, but by Austrian bayonets. As it is my design to present these in another lecture, I simply allude to them in this connection. But the most important revolution which occurred at this period, taking into view its ultimate consequences and its various complications, was that of Greece. It was different from those of Spain and Italy in this respect, that it was a struggle not to gain political rights from oppressive rulers, but to secure national independence as such it is invested with great interest moreover it was glorious since it was ultimately successful after a dreadful contest with turkey for seven years during which half of the population was swept away greece probably would have succumbed to a powerful empire but for the aid tardily rendered her by foreign powers 
united in this instance not to suppress rebellion but to rescue a noble and gallant people from a cruel despotism had the armed intervention of russia england and france taken place at an earlier period much suffering and bloodshed might have been averted but russia was fettered by the holy alliance to suppress all insurrection and attempts at constitutional liberty wherever they might take place and could not consistently with the promises given to austria and prussia join in an armed intervention even in a matter dear to the heart of alexander whose religion was that of greece the czar was placed in an awkward position if he gave assistance to the greeks whose religious faith was the same as his own and whose foe was also the traditional enemy of russia he would violate his promises which he always held sacred and give umbrage to austria the intolerant hatred of alexander for all insurrections whatever induced him to stand aloof from a contest which jeopardized the stability of thrones and with which in a political view as an absolute sovereign he had no sympathy on the other hand if alexander remained neutral his faith would be trodden under foot and that by a power which he detested both politically and religiously a power too with which russia had often been at war if turkey triumphed in the contest rebels against a long constituted authority might indeed be put down but a hostile power would be strengthened dangerous to all schemes of russian aggrandizement consequently alexander was undecided in his policy yet his indecision tore his mind with anguish and probably shortened his days he was on the whole a good man but he was a despot and did not really know what to do england and france again were weakened by the long wars of napoleon and wanted repose their sympathies were with the greeks but they shielded themselves behind the principles of non-intervention which were the public law of europe so the poor greeks were left for six years to struggle alone and unaided against the whole force of the turkish empire before relief came when they were on the verge of annihilation it was the struggle of a little country about half the size of scotland against an empire four times as large as great britain and france combined of a population less than a million against twenty-five millions it was more than this it was in many important respects a war between asia and europe kindred in spirit with the old crusades it was a war of races and religions rather than of political principles and hence it was marked by inhuman atrocities on both sides reminding us of the old wars between jews and syrians it was a tragedy at which the whole civilized world gazed with blended interest and horror it was infinitely more fierce than any contest which has taken place in europe for three hundred years to the greeks themselves it was after the first successes the most discouraging contest that i know of in human history and yet it had all those elements of heroism which marked the insurrection of the hollanders under william the silent against the combined forces of austria and spain it was grand in its ideas like our own revolutionary war and the liberty which was finally gained was purchased by greater sacrifices than any recorded in any war either ancient or modern the war of italian independence was a mere holiday demonstration in comparison with it even the polish wars against russia were nothing to it in the sufferings which were endured and the gallant feats which were performed but as greece was a small and distant country its memorable contest was not invested with the interest felt for battles on a larger scale and which more directly affected the interests of other nations it was not till its complications involved turkey and russia in war and affected the whole eastern question that its historical importance was seen it was perhaps only the beginning of a series of wars which may drive the ottoman turks out of europe and make constantinople a great prize for future conquerors that is unquestionably what russia wants and covets today and what the other great powers are determined she shall not have possibly greece may yet be the renewed seat of a greek empire under the protection of the western nations as a barrier to russian encroachments around the black sea there is sympathy for the greeks none for the turks england france and austria can form no lasting alliance with mohammedans who may be driven back into asia not by russians but by a coalition of the latin and gothic races it is useless however to speculate on the future wars of the world we only know that offenses must needs come so long as nations and rulers are governed by more interests and passions than by reason or philanthropy when will passions and interests cease to be dominant or disturbing forces to these most of the wars which history records are to be traced and yet whatever may be the origin or character of wars those who stimulate or engage in them find plausible excuses necessity patriotism expediency self-defense even religion and liberty 
so long then as men are blinded by their passions and interests and palliate or justify their wars by either truth or sophistry there is but little hope that they will cease even with the advance of civilization when has there been a long period unmarked by war when have wars been more destructive and terrible than within the memory of this generation it would indeed seem that when nations shall learn that their real interests are not antagonistic that they cannot afford to go to war with one another peace would then prevail as a policy not less than as a principle this is the hopeful view to take but unfortunately it is not the lesson taught by history nor by that philosophy which has been generally accepted by christendom for eighteen hundred years which is that men will not be governed by the loftiest principles until the religion of jesus shall have conquered and changed the heart of the world or at least of those who rule the world the chapter i am about to present is one of war cruel merciless relentless war therefore repulsive and only interesting from the magnitude of the issues fought out indeed on a narrow strip of territory what matter whether the battlefield is large or small there was as much heroism in the struggles of the dutch republic as in the wars of napoleon as much in our warfare for independence as in the suppression of the southern rebellion as much among cromwell's soldiers as in the crimean war as much at thermopylae as at platea it is the greatness of a cause which gives to war its only justification a cause is sacred from the dignity of its principles men are nothing principles are everything men must die it is of comparatively little moment whether they fall like autumn leaves or perish in a storm they are alike forgotten but their ideas and virtues are imperishable eternal lessons for successive generations history is a record not merely of human sufferings these are inevitable but also of the stepping stones of progress which indicate both the permanent welfare of men and the divine hand which mysteriously but really guides and governs when the greek revolution broke out in eighteen twenty there were about seven hundred thousand people inhabiting a little over twenty one thousand square miles of territory with a revenue of about fifteen millions of dollars large for such a country of mountains and valleys but the soil is fertile and the climate propitious favorable for grapes olives and maize it is a country easily defended with its steep mountains its deep ravines and rugged cliffs and when as at that time roads were almost impassable for carriages and artillery its people have always been celebrated for bravery industry and frugality like the swiss but prone to jealousies and party feuds it had in eighteen twenty no central government no great capital and no regular army it owed allegiance to the sultan at constantinople the turks having conquered greece soon after that city was taken by them in fourteen fifty three amid all the severities of turkish rule for four centuries the greeks maintained their religion their language and distinctive manners in some places they were highly prosperous from commerce which they engrossed along the whole coast of the levant and among the islands of the archipelago they had six hundred vessels bearing six thousand guns and manned by eighteen thousand seamen in their beautiful islands where burning sappho loved and sung abodes of industry and freedom the turkish pashas never set their foot satisfied with the tribute which was punctually paid to the sultan moreover these islands were nurseries of seamen for the turkish navy and as these seamen were indispensable to the sultan the country that produced them was kindly treated the turks were indifferent to commerce and allowed the greek merchants to get rich provided they paid their tribute the turks cared only for war and pleasure and spent their time in alternate excitement and lazy repose they disdained labor which they bought with tribute money or secured from slaves taken in war like the romans they were warriors and conquerors but became enervated by luxury they were hard masters but their conquered subjects throve by commerce and industry the greeks as to character were not religious like the turks but quicker witted what religion they had was made up of the ceremonies and pomps of a corrupted christianity but kept alive by traditions their patriarch was a great personage practically appointed however by the sultan and resident in constantinople their clergy were married and were more humane and liberal than the roman catholic priests of italy and about on par with them in morals and influence the greeks were always inquisitive and fond of knowledge but their love of liberty has been one of their strongest peculiarities kept alive amid all the oppressions to which they have been subjected nevertheless unarmed at least on the mainland and without fortresses few in numbers with overwhelming foes they had not up to eighteen twenty dared to risk a general rebellion for fear that they should be mercilessly slaughtered so long as they remained at peace their condition as a conquered people was not so bad as it might have been 
although the oppressions of tax-gatherers and the brutality of Turkish officials had been growing more and more intolerable. In 1770 and 1790 there had been local and unsuccessful attempts at revolt, but nothing of importance. Amid the political agitations which threw Spain and Italy into revolution, however, the spirit of liberty revived among the hardy Greek mountaineers of the mainland. Secret societies were formed, with a view of shaking off the Turkish yoke. The aspiring and the discontented naturally cast their eyes to Russia for aid, since there was a religious bond between the Russians and the Greeks, and since the Russians and Turks were mortal enemies, and since, moreover, they were encouraged to hope for such aid by a great Russian nobleman, by birth a Greek, who was private secretary and minister, as well as an intimate of the Emperor Alexander, Count Capo de Istrias. They were also exasperated by the cession of Parga, a town on the mainland opposite the Ionian Islands, to the Turks, by the Treaty of 1815, which the Allies carelessly overlooked. The flame of insurrection in 1820 did not, however, first break out in the territory of Greece, but in Wallachia, a Turkish province on the north of the Danube governed by a Greek hospodar, the capital of which was Bucharest. This was followed by the revolt of another Turkish province, Moldavia, bordering on Russia, from which it was separated by the river Pruth. At Jassy, the capital, Prince Ypsilanti, a distinguished Russian general, descended from an illustrious Greek family, raised the standard of insurrection, to which flocked the whole Christian population of the province, who fell upon the Turkish soldiers and massacred them. Ypsilanti had twenty thousand soldiers under his command, against which the six hundred armed Turks could make but feeble resistance. This apparently successful revolt produced an immense enthusiasm throughout Greece, the inhabitants of which now eagerly took up arms. The Greeks had been assured of the aid of Russia by Ypsilanti, who counted without his host, however. For the Tsar, then at the Congress of Leibach, convened to put down revolutionary ideas, was extremely angry at the conduct of Ypsilanti, and, against all expectation, stood aloof. This was the time for him to attack Turkey, then weakened and dilapidated. But he was tired of war. Among the Greeks the wildest enthusiasm prevailed, especially throughout the Moria, the ancient Peloponnesus. The peasants everywhere gathered around their chieftains and drove away the Turkish soldiers, inflicting on them the grossest barbarities. In a few days the Turks possessed nothing in the Moria but their fortresses. The Turkish garrison of Athens shut itself up in the Acropolis. Most of the islands of the Archipelago hoisted the standard of the cross, and the strongest of them armed and sent out cruisers to prey on the commerce of the enemy. At Constantinople the news of the insurrection excited both consternation and rage. Instant death to the Christians was the universal cry. The Mussulmans seized the Greek patriarch, an old man of eighty, while he was performing a religious service on Easter Sunday, hanged him, and delivered his body to the Jews. The Sultan Mohammed was intensely exasperated, and ordered a levy of troops throughout his empire to suppress the insurrection and to punish the Christians. The atrocities which the Turks now inflicted have scarcely ever been equaled in horror. The Christian churches were entered and sacked. At Adrianople, the patriarch was beheaded with eight other ecclesiastical dignitaries. In ten days, thousands of Christians in that city were butchered, and their wives and daughters sold into slavery, while five archbishops and three bishops were hanged in the streets without trial. There was scarcely a town in the empire where atrocities of the most repulsive kind were not perpetrated on innocent and helpless people. In Asia Minor, the fanatical spirit raged with more ferocity than in European Turkey. At Smyrna, a general massacre of the Christians took place under circumstances of peculiar atrocity, and 15,000 were obliged to flee the islands of the archipelago to save their lives. The island of Cyprus, which once had a population of more than a million, reduced at the breaking out of the insurrection to 70,000, was nearly depopulated. The archbishop and five other bishops were ruthlessly murdered. The whole island, 146 miles long and 63 wide, was converted into a theater of rapine, violation, and bloodshed. All saw that no hope remained for Greece but in the most determined resistance, which was nobly made. Six thousand men were soon in arms in Thessaly. The mountaineers of Macedonia gathered into armed bands. Thirty thousand rose in the peninsula of Cassandra and laid siege to Salonica, a city of eighty thousand inhabitants, but were repulsed and fled to the mountains not, however, until thousands of Mussulmans were slain. It had become war to the knife and the knife to the hilt. No quarter was asked or given. All Greece was now aroused to what was universally felt to be a death struggle. 
the people eagerly responded to all patriotic influences and especially to war songs some of which had been sung for more than two thousand years certain of these were reproduced by the english poet byron who leaving his native land entered heart and soul into the desperate contest and urged the greeks to heroic action in memory of their fathers then manfully despising the turkish tyrant's yoke let your country see you rising and all her chains are broke brave shades of chiefs and sages behold the coming strife hellenes of past ages o oh, start again to life at the sound of trumpet breaking your sleep o oh, join with me in the seven-hilled city seeking fight conquer till we're free success now seemed to mark the uprising in southern greece but in the danubian provinces without the expected aid of russia it was far otherwise prince ypsilanti who had taken an active part in the insurrection was dismissed from the russian service and summoned back to russia but he was not discouraged and advanced to bucharest with ten thousand men in the meantime ten thousand turks entered the principalities and moldavia ypsilanti fled before the conquering enemy abandoned bucharest and was totally defeated at dragashkan with the loss of all his baggage and ammunition only twenty-five of his hastily collected band escaped into transylvania end of section sixteen section seventeen of beacon lights of history volume nine european statesman by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by K. Hand. The Greek Revolution, Part Two. The intelligence of this disaster would have disheartened the Greeks, but for their naval successes among the islands of the archipelago. Hydra, Ipsara, and Samos equipped a flotilla which drove the Turkish fleet back to the Dardanelles with immense losses. The Greeks, having now the command of the sea, made successful incursions and hoisted their flag at Missolonghi which they easily fortified it being situated in the midst of lagoons like venice which large ships could not penetrate but on the mainland they suffered severe reverses fifteen thousand greeks perished at patras but the patriots were successful at valteza where five thousand men repulsed fifteen thousand turks and drove them to seek shelter in the strong fortress of tripolitza the greeks avoiding action in the open field succeeded in taking navarino and napoli del malvasia and rivalled their enemies in the atrocities they committed they lost athens whose citadel they had besieged but defeated the turks in thermopylae with great slaughter which enabled them to reoccupy athens and blockade the acropolis then followed the siege of tripolitza in the centre of the maria the seat of the pasha where the turks were strongly entrenched it was soon taken by Colocatronus, who commanded the Greeks. The fall of this fortress was followed by the usual massacre, in which neither age nor sex was spared. The Greek chiefs attempted to suppress the fury and cruelty of their followers, but their efforts were in vain, and their cause was stained with blood needlessly shed. Yet when one remembers the centuries during which the Turks had been slaying the men, carrying off the women to their harems, and making slaves of the children of the Greeks, there is no less to wonder at in such an access of blind fury and vengeance nine thousand turks were massacred or slain in the attack the capture of this important fortress was of immense advantage to the greeks who obtained great treasures and a large amount of ammunition with a valuable train of artillery but this great success was balanced by the failure of the greeks under ypsilanti to capture napoli de romane another strong fortress defended by eight hundred guns regarded as nearly impregnable situated like gibraltar on a great rock eight hundred feet high the base of which was washed by the sea it was a rash enterprise but came near being successful on account of the negligence of the garrison which numbered only fifteen hundred men an escalade was attempted by mavrocordatos one of the heroic chieftains of the greeks but it was successfully repulsed and the attacking generals with difficulty escaped to argus the greeks also met with a reverse on the peninsula of cassandra near salonica which proved another massacre three thousand perished from turkish scimitars and ten thousand women and children were sold into slavery thus ended the campaign of eighteen twenty one with mutual successes and losses disgraced on both sides by treachery and massacres but the greeks were sufficiently emboldened to declare their independence and form a constitution under prince mavrocordatos as president a chian by birth who had been physician to the sultan 
the seat of government was fixed at corinth whose fortress had been recovered from the turks seven hundred thousand people threw down the gauntlet to twenty-five millions and defied their power the following year the greek cause indirectly suffered a great blow by the capture and death of ali pasha this ambitious and daring rebel from humble origin had arisen by energy ability and fraud to a high command under the sultan he became pasha of thessaly and having accumulated great riches by extortion and oppression he bought the pasha lick of janina in one of the richest and most beautiful valleys of epirus in the centre of a lake he built an impregnable fortress collected a large body of albanian troops and soon became master of the whole province he preserved an apparent neutrality between the sultan and the rebellious greeks whom however he secretly encouraged in his castle at janina he meditated extensive conquests and independence of the port at one time he had eighty thousand half-disciplined albanians under his command the sultan at last suspecting his treachery summoned him to constantinople and on his refusal to appear denounced him as a rebel and sent chorchid pasha one of his ablest generals with forty thousand troops to subdue him this was no easy task and for two years before the greek revolution broke out ali had maintained his independence at last he found himself besieged in his island castle impregnable against assault but short of provisions from this retreat he was decoyed by consummate art to the mainland to meet the turkish general who promised an important command and a high rank in the turkish service in the power now of the turks he was at once beheaded and his head sent to constantinople ali's death set free the large army of chorchid pasha to be employed against the greeks aided too by the enthusiasm which the suppression of a dangerous enemy created the sultan made great preparations for a renewed attack on the maria the contest now assumed greater proportions and the reconquest of greece seemed extremely probable sixty thousand turks under the command of the ablest general of the sultan prepared to invade the maria in addition a powerful squadron with eight thousand troops sailed from the dardanelles to reinforce the turkish fortresses and furnish provisions in the meantime the insurrection extended to chios or Sio, an opulent and fertile island opposite smyrna it had eighty thousand inhabitants who drove the turks to their citadel the sultan enraged at the loss of this prosperous island sent thirty thousand fanatical asiatic mussulmans and a fleet consisting of six ships of the line ten frigates and twelve brigs to reconquer what was regarded as the garden of the archipelago resistance was impossible against such an overwhelming array of forces who massacred nearly the whole of the male population and sold their wives and children as slaves the consuls of france and austria remonstrated against this unheard-of cruelty but nothing could appease the fanatical fury of the conquerors the massacre has no parallel in history since the storming of syracuse or the sack of baghdad not only were the inhabitants swept away but the churches the fine villas the scattered houses and the villages were burned to the ground when the slaughter ceased it was found that twenty five thousand men had been slain and forty five thousand women and children had become slaves to glut the markets of constantinople and egypt while fifteen thousand had fled to the mainland this great calamity however was partially avenged by the sailors and chiefs of hydra a neighboring island under the command of one of the greatest heroes that the war produced the intrepid and fearless andreas mialuis who with fire ships destroyed nearly the whole of the turkish fleet he was aided by constantine canaris and george pepinus equal to him in courage who succeeded in grappling the ships of the enemy and setting them on fire the turks with the remnant of their magnificent fleet took refuge in the harbor of mytilene while the victors returned in triumph to Ipsara and became the masters of the archipelago the greek operations were not so fortunate at first on the land as they were on the sea mavrocodatos led in person an expedition into epirus but he was no general and failed disastrously even the brave marco bazarus was unable to cut his way to the relief of his countrymen shut up in their fortresses without an adequate supply of provisions and all that the greeks could do in their great discouragement was to supply missilonagi with provisions and a few defenders in anticipation of a siege epirus was now fallen and nothing remained but a guerrilla warfare indeed a striking feature of the whole revolution was the absence of any one great leader to concentrate the greek forces and utilize the splendid heroism of the people and chieftains in permanent strategic successes the war was a succession of sporadic fights successes and failures with small apparent mutual relations and effects 
in macedonia which had joined the insurrection there were six thousand brave mountaineers in arms but they had to contend with fifteen thousand regular troops under the command of the pashas of salonica and thessaly who forced the passes of the vale of tempe and slew all before them Chorjid pasha having his rear provided for with thirty thousand men now passed through the defile of thermopylae appeared before corinth took its citadel advanced to argus dispersed the government which had established itself there and then pursued his victorious career to napoli di romani whose garrison he reinforced but the summer sun dried up the surrounding plains there was nothing left on which his cavalry could feed or his men either and he found himself in a perilous position in the midst of victory the defeated greeks now rallied under ypsilanti and colocatronus who raised the siege of corinth and advanced against their foes with twelve thousand men the turkish army decimated and in fear of starvation resolved to cut their way through the guarded defiles and is succeeded only by the loss of seven thousand men with all their baggage and military stores the morea was delivered from the oppressor and the turkish army of thirty thousand was destroyed chorjid pasha was soon after seized with dysentery brought about by fatigue and anxiety to which he succumbed and the ablest general yet sent against the greeks failed disastrously to the joy of the nation this great success was followed by others the acropolis of athens capitulated to the victorious greeks not without the usual atrocities and attica was recovered but the mountains of epirus were still filled with turkish troops who advanced to lay siege to missolonghi defended by a small garrison of four hundred men under marco bazarus Mavrocordatos contrived to come to his relief, and the town soon had three thousand defenders. Six times did the Turks attempt an assault under Omar Vrion, but each time they were repulsed with great slaughter and compelled to retreat. The Turkish general lost three-quarters of his army, and with difficulty escaped himself in an open boat. Altogether twelve thousand Turks perished in this disastrous siege with the loss of their artillery as the insurrection had now assumed formidable proportions in cyprus and candia a general appeal was made to mussulmans of those islands whose numbers greatly exceeded the rebels twenty five thousand men rallied around the standards of the moslems but they were driven into their fortresses leaving both plains and mountains in the hands of the greeks these brave insurgents gained still another great success in this memorable campaign they carried the important fortress of napoli di romania by escalade december twelfth under colocotronus with ten thousand men and the garrison weakened by famine capitulated four hundred pieces of cannon with large stores of ammunition were the reward of the victors this conquest was the more remarkable since a large turkish fleet was sent to the relief of the fortress but fearing the fireships of the greeks the turkish admiral sailed away without doing anything and cast anchor in the bay of tenedos here he was attacked by the greek fire ships commanded by canaris and his fleet were obliged to cut their cables and sail back to the dardanelles with the loss of their largest ships the conqueror was crowned with laurel at ipsara by his grateful countrymen and the campaign of eighteen twenty two closed leaving the greeks masters of the sea and of nearly the whole of their territory this campaign considering the inequality of forces is regarded by allison as one of the most glorious in the annals of war a population of seven hundred thousand souls had confronted and beaten the splendid strength of the ottoman empire with twenty-five millions of mussulmans they had destroyed four-fifths of an army of fifty thousand men and had made themselves masters of their principal strongholds twice had they driven the turkish fleets from the aegean sea with the loss of their finest ships but greece during the two years warfare had lost two hundred thousand inhabitants not slain in battle but massacred and killed by various inhumanities it was clear that the country could not much longer bear such a strain unless the great powers of europe came to its relief but no relief came canning who ruled england sympathized with the greeks but would not depart from his policy of non-intervention fearing to embroil all europe in war it was the same with louis the eighteenth who feared the stability of his throne and dared not offend austria who looked on the contest with indifference as a rebellious insurrection prussia took the same ground and even russia stood aloof unprepared for war with the turks which would have immediately resulted if the czar had rendered assistance to the greeks never was a nation in greater danger of annihilation in spite of its glorious resistance than was greece at that time for what could the remaining five hundred thousand people do against twenty-five millions inspired with fanatical hatred but to sell their lives as dearly as they might the contest was like that of the maccabees against the overwhelming armies of syria 
as was to be expected the disgraceful defeat of his fleets and armies filled the sultan with rage and renewed resolution the whole power of his empire was now called out to suppress the rebellion he had long meditated the destruction of that famous military corps in the turkish service known as the janizaries who were not turks but recruited from the youth of the greeks and other subject races captured in war they had become mussulmans and were superb fighters but their insults and insolence endangered by their traditional pride and the prestige of the corps and the favor shown them by successive sultans filled mahmoud with wrath the sultan disassembled his resentment however in order to bring all the soldiers he could command to the utter destruction of his rebellious subjects he deposed his grand vizier and sent orders to all the pashas in his dominions for a general levy of all mussulmans between fifteen and fifty to assemble in thessaly in may eighteen twenty three he also made the utmost efforts to repair the disasters of his fleet the greeks too made corresponding exertions to maintain their armies though weakened they were not despondent their successes had filled them with new hopes and energies their independence seemed to them to be established they even began to despise their foes but as soon as success seemed to have crowned their efforts they were subject to a new danger there were divisions strifes and jealousies between the chieftains unity so essential in war was seriously jeoparded had they remained united and buried their resentments and jealousies in the cause of patriotism their independence possibly might have been acknowledged but in the absence of a central power the various generals wished to fight on their own account like guerrilla chiefs they would not even submit to the national assembly the leaders were so full of discords and personal ambition that they would not unite on anything mavrocordatos and ypsilanti were not on speaking terms one is naturally astonished at such suicidal courses but he forgets what a powerful passion jealousy is in the human soul it was not absent from our own war of independence in which at one time rival generals would have supplanted if possible even washington himself indeed it is present everywhere not in war alone but among all influential and ambitious people women of society legislators artists physicians singers actors even clergymen authors and professors in colleges this unfortunate passion can be kept down only by the overpowering dominancy of transcendent ability which everybody must concede when envy is turned into admiration as in the case of napoleon there was no one chieftain among the greeks who called out universal homage any more than there was in the camp of agamemnon before the walls of troy there were men of ability and patriotism and virtue but as already noted no one of them was great enough to exact universal and willing obedience and this fact was well understood in all the cabinets of europe as well as in the camps of their enemies the disunions and dissensions of the rival greek generals were of more advantage to the turks than a force of fifty thousand men these jealous chieftains however had reason to be startled in the spring of eighteen twenty three when they heard that eighty thousand mussulmans were to be sent to attack the isthmus of corinth that forty thousand more were to undertake the siege of missolonghi that fifty thousand in addition were to cooperate in thessaly and attica while a grand fleet of one hundred and twenty sail was to sweep the aegean and reduce the revolted islands it was however the very magnitude of the hostile forces which saved the greeks from impending ruin for these forces had to be fed in dried up and devastated plains under scorching suns in the defiles of mountains where artillery was of no use and where hardy mountaineers behind rocks and precipices could fire upon them unseen and without danger there was more loss from famine and pestilence than from foes a lesson repeatedly taught for three thousand years but one which governments have ever been slow to learn alexander the great had learned it when he invaded persia with a small army of veterans rather than with a mob of undisciplined allies huge armies are not to be relied on except when they form a vast mechanism directed by a master hand when they are sure of their supplies and when they operate in a wholesome country with nothing to fear from malaria or inclemency of weather then they can crush all before them like some terrible and irresistible machine but only then this the old crusaders learned to their cost as well as the invading armies of napoleon amid the snows of russia and even the disciplined troops of france and england when they marched to the siege of sebastopol hence in spite of the division of the greeks which paralyzed their best efforts the turkish armies affected but little great as were their number in the campaign of eighteen twenty three the intrepid marco bazarus with only five thousand men kept the turks at bay in epirus and chased a large body of albanians to the sea 
while Odysseus defended the pass of Thermopylae and prevented the advance of the Turks into southern Greece. The grand army destined for the invasion of the Morea gradually melted away in attacking fortresses and under the desultory actions of guerrilla bands amidst rocks and thickets. Bozaris surprised a Turkish army near Missolonghi by a nocturnal attack, and although he himself bravely perished, the attack was successful. The Turks, in renewed numbers, however, advanced to the siege of Missolonghi, but they were again repulsed with great slaughter. The naval campaign, from which so much was expected by the Sultan, also proved a failure. As usual, the Greeks resorted to their fire ships, not being able openly to contend with superior forces, and drove the fleet back again to the Dardanelles. When the sea was clear, they were able to reinforce Missolonghi with three thousand men and a large supply of provisions, for it was foreseen that the siege would be renewed. It was at this time, when the Greek cause was imperiled by the dissensions of the leading chieftains, when Greece indeed was threatened by civil war, in addition to its contest with the Turks, when the whole country was impoverished and devastated, when the population was melting away and no revenue could be raised to pay the half-starved and half-naked troops, that Lord Byron arrived at Missolonghi to share his fortune with the defenders of an uncertain cause. Like most scholars and poets, he had a sentimental attachment for the classic land, the teacher of the ancient world, and in common with his countrymen he admired the noble struggles and sacrifices, worthy of ancient heroes, which the Greeks, though divided and demoralized, had put forth to recover their liberties. His money contributions were valuable, but it was his moral support which accomplished the most for Grecian independence. Though unpopular and maligned at this time in England for his immoralities and haughty disdain, he was still the greatest poet of his age, a peer and a man of transcendent genius of whom any country would be proud. That such a man, embittered and in broken health, should throw his whole soul into the contest, with a disinterestedness which never was questioned, shows not only that he had many noble traits, but that his example would have great weight with enlightened nations, and open their eyes to the necessity of rallying to the cause of liberty. The faults of the Greeks were many, but these faults were such as would naturally be produced by four hundred years of oppression and scorn, of craft, treachery, and insensibility to suffering. As for their jealousies and quarrels, when was there ever a time, even in periods of their highest glory, when these were not their national characteristics? End of section 17 Section 18 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 9, European Statesmen, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. The Greek Revolution, Part 3. Interest in the affairs of Greece now began to be awakened, especially among the English, and the result was a loan of eight hundred thousand pounds raised in London for the Greek government, at the rate of fifty-nine pounds for one hundred pounds. Grace really obtained only two hundred eighty thousand pounds, while it contracted a debt of eighty thousand pounds. Yet this disadvantageous loan was of great service to an utterly impoverished government, about to contend with the large armies of the Turks. The Sultan had made immense preparations for the campaign of 1824, and had obtained the assistance of the celebrated Ibrahim Pasha, adopted son of Mohammed Ali, Pasha of Egypt, who with his Egyptian troops had nearly subdued Crete. Over 100,000 men were now directed, by sea and land, to western Greece and Missolonghi, of which 20,000 were disciplined Egyptian troops. With this great force, the Mussulmans assumed the offensive, and the condition of Greece was never more critical. First, the islands of Spezia and Ipsara were attacked, the latter being little more than a barren rock, but the abode of liberty. It was poorly defended, and was enabled to cope with the Turkish armada, having on board 15,000 disciplined troops. Canaris advised a combat on the sea, but was overruled, and the consequences were fatal. The island was taken and sacked, and all the inhabitants were put to the sword. In addition to this great calamity, the spoil made by the victors was immense, including two hundred pieces of artillery and ninety vessels. Canaris, however, contrived to escape in a boat to pursue a victorious career with his fireships. The Turkish and Egyptian fleets had effected a junction, consisting of one ship of the line, twenty-five frigates, twenty-five corvettes, fifty brigs and schooners, and two hundred and forty transports, carrying eighty thousand soldiers and sailors and twenty-five hundred cannon. To oppose this great armament, the Greek admiral Mialus 
had only seventy sail manned by five thousand sailors and carrying eight hundred guns in spite however of this disproportion of forces he advanced to meet the enemy and dispersed it with a great turkish loss of fifteen thousand men all that the turks had gained was a barren island on the land the turks had more successes but these were so indecisive that they did not attempt to renew the siege of Missolonghi, and the campaign of eighteen twenty four closed with a great loss to the mussulmans the little army and fleet of the greeks had repelled one hundred and twenty thousand soldiers confident of success but the population was now reduced to less than five hundred thousand becoming feebler every day and the national treasury was empty while the whole country was a scene of desolation and misery and yet strange to say the greeks continued their dissensions while on the very brink of ruin stranger still their courage was unabated the year 1825 opened with brighter prospects. The rival chieftains, in view of the desperate state of affairs, at last united and seemingly buried in their jealousies. A new loan was contracted in London of two million pounds, and the naval forces were increased. But the Turks also made their preparations for a renewed conflict, and Ibrahim Pasha felt himself strong enough to undertake the siege of Navarino, which fell into his hands after a brave resistance. Tripolitza also capitulated to the Egyptian, and the Morea was occupied by his troops after several engagements. After this, the Greeks never ventured to fight in the open field, but only in guerrilla bands, in mountain passes, and behind fortifications. Then began the memorable siege of Missolonghi under Rashid Pasha. It was probably the strongest town in Greece, by reason not of its fortifications, but of the surrounding marshes and lagoons, which made it inaccessible into this town the armed peasantry threw themselves with five thousand troops under nikitas while mialis with his fleet raised the blockade by sea and supplied the town with provisions Rashid pasha determined on an assault but was driven back thrice he advanced with his troops only to be repulsed his forces at the end of october were reduced to three thousand men the sultan irritated by successive disasters brought the whole disposable force of his empire to bear on the doomed city Ibrahim, powerfully reinforced with twenty-five thousand men, by sea and land stormed battery after battery, yet the Greeks held out, contending with famine and pestilence, as well as with troops ten times their number. At last they were unable to offer further resistance, and they resolved on a general sortie to break through the enemy's line to a place of safety. The women of the town put on male attire, and armed themselves with pistols and daggers. The whole population, men, William, and children, on the night of the twenty second of april eighteen twenty six issued from their defences crossed the moat in silence passed the ditches and trenches and made their way through an opening of the besiegers lines for a while the sortie seemed to be successful but mistakes were made a panic ensued and most of the flying crowd retreated back to the deserted town only to be massacred by turkish scimitars some made their escape a column of nearly two thousand after incredible hardships succeeded in reaching salonica in safety but missolonghi fell with a loss of nearly ten thousand killed wounded and prisoners it was a great disaster but it proved in the end the foundation of greek independence by creating a general burst of blended enthusiasm and indignation throughout europe the heroic defense of this stronghold against such overwhelming forces opened the eyes of european statesmen public sentiment in england in favor of the struggling nation could no longer be disregarded mr canning took up the cause both from enthusiasm and policy the english ambassador at constantinople had a secret interview with mavro cordatos on an island near hydra and promised him the intervention of england the death of Tsar alexander gave a new aspect to affairs for his successor nicholas made up his mind to raise his standard in turkey the national voice of russia was now for war the Duke of Wellington was sent to St. Petersburg, nominally to congratulate the Tsar on his accession, but really to arrange for an armed intervention for the protection of Greece. The Hellenic government ordered a general conscription, for Ibrahim Pasha was organizing new forces for the subjection of the Morea and the reduction of Napoli di Romania and Hydra, while a powerful fleet put to sea from Alexandria. No sooner did this fleet appear, however, than Canaris and Maeolus attacked it with their dreaded fire-ships, and the forty ships of Egypt fled from fourteen small Greek vessels and re-entered the Dardanelles. 
but the turks always more fortunate on land than by sea pressed now the siege of the acropolis and athens fell into their hands early in eighteen twenty seven for six or seven years the greeks had struggled heroically but relief was now at hand russia and england signed a protocol on the sixth of july and france soon after joined to put an end to the sanguinary contest the terms proposed to the sultan by the three great powers were moderate that he should still retain a nominal sovereignty over the revolted provinces and receive an annual tribute but the haughty and exasperated sultan indignantly rejected them and made renewed preparations to continue the contest ibrahim landed his forces on the moria and renewed his depredations once more the ambassadors of the allied powers presented their final note to the turkish government and again it was insultingly disregarded the allied admirals then entered the port of navarino where the turkish and egyptian fleets were at an anchor with ten ships of the line ten frigates with other vessels altogether carrying thirteen hundred and twenty four guns the ottoman force consisted of seventy nine vessels armed with twenty two hundred and forty guns strict orders were given not to fire while negotiations were going on but an accidental shot from a turkish vessel brought on a general action and the combined turkish and egyptian fleet was literally annihilated october twentieth eighteen twenty seven this was the greatest disaster which the ottoman turks had yet experienced indeed it practically ended the whole contest christendom had at last come to the rescue when greece unaided was incapable of further resistance the battle of navarino excited of course the wildest enthusiasm throughout greece and a corresponding joy throughout europe never since the battle of lepanto was there such a general exultation among christian nations this single battle decided the fate of greece the admirals of the allied fleet were doubtless the aggressors in the battle but the turks were the aggressors in the war canning of england did not live to enjoy the triumph of the cause which he had come to have so much at heart he was the inspiring genius who induced both russia and france now under charles x to intervene chateaubriand the minister of charles x was in perfect accord with canning from poetical and sentimental reasons politically his policy was that of metternich who could see no distinction between the insurrection of naples and that of greece in the great austrian's eyes all people alike who aspired to gain popular liberty or constitutional government were rebels to be crushed canning however sympathized in his latter days with all people striving for independence whether in south america or greece but his opinion was not shared by english statesmen of the tory school and he had the greatest difficulty in bringing his colleagues over to his views when he died england again relapsed into neutrality and inaction under the government of wellington charles the tenth in france had no natural liking for the greek cause and only wanted to be undisturbed in his schemes of despotism russia under nicholas determined to fight turkey unfettered by allies she sought but a pretext for a declaration of war turkey furnished to russia that pretext right in the stress of her own military weakness when she was exhausted by a war of seven years and by the destructions of the janissaries which the sultan had long meditated and concealed in his own bosom with the craft which formed one of the peculiarities of this cruel yet able sovereign but which he finally executed with characteristic savagery concerning this russian war we shall speak presently the battle of navarino although it made the restoration of the turkish power impossible in greece still left ibrahim master of the fortresses and it was two years before the turkish troops were finally expelled but independence was now assured and the greeks set about establishing their government with some permanency before the end of that year capo de istrius was elected president for seven years and in january eighteen twenty eight he entered upon his office his ideas of government were arbitrary for he had been the minister and favorite of alexander he wished to rule like an absolute sovereign his short reign was a sort of dictatorship his council was composed entirely of his creatures and he sought at once to destroy provincial and municipal authority he limited the freedom of the press and violated the secrecy of the males in plato's home plato's gorgias could not be read because it spoke too strongly against tyrants capo diestrius found it hard to organize and govern amid the hostilities of rival chieftains and the general anarchy which prevailed local self-government lay at the root of greek nationality but this he ignored and set himself to organize an administrative system modeled after that of france during the reign of napoleon intellectually he stood at the head of the nation and was a man of great integrity of character as austere and upright as guizot having no toleration for freebooters and peculators 
he became unpopular among the sailors and merchants who had been so effective in the warfare with the Turks. A dark shadow fell over his government, as it became more harsh and intolerant, and he was assassinated the ninth of October, 1831. The allied sovereigns who had taken the Greeks under their protection now felt the need of a stronger and more stable government for them than a republic, and determined to establish an hereditary but constitutional monarchy. The crown was offered to Prince Leopold of Saxe-Coburg, who at first accepted it, but when the prince began to look into the real estate of the country, curtailed in its limits by the jealousies of the English government, rent with anarchy and dissension, containing a people so long enslaved that they could not make orderly use of freedom, he declined the proffered crown. It was then, 1832, offered to and accepted by Prince Otho of Bavaria, a minor, and 3,500 Bavarian soldiers maintained order during the three years of the Regency, which, though it developed great activity, was divided in itself, and conspiracies took place to overthrow it. The year 1835 saw the majority of the king who then assumed the government. In the same year the capital was transferred to Athens, which was nothing but a heap of rubbish, but the city soon after had a university and also became an important port. In 1843, after a military revolution against the German elements of Otho's government, which had increased from year to year, the Greeks obtained from the king a representative constitution to which he took an oath in 1844. But the limits of the kingdom were small, and neither Crete, Thessaly, Epirus, nor the Ionian islands were included in it. In 1846 these islands were ceded by Great Britain to Greece, which was also strengthened by the annexation of Thessaly. Since then the progress of the country in material wealth and in education has been rapid. Otho reigned until 1862, although amid occasional outbreaks of impatience and revolt against the reactionary tendencies of his rule. In that year he fled with his queen from a formidable uprising, and in 1863 Prince William, son of Christian the Ninth, King of Denmark, was elected monarch under the title of George I, King of the Hellenes. The resurrection of Greece was thus finally effected. It was added to the European kingdoms, and now bids fair to be prosperous and happy. Thus did the old Hellas rise from the grave of nations. Scorched by fire, riddled by shot, baptized by blood, she emerged victorious from the conflict. She achieved her independence because she proved herself worthy of it. She was trained to manhood in the only school of real improvement, the school of suffering. The Greek Revolution has another aspect than battles on the Moria, massacres on the islands of the archipelago, naval enterprises under heroic seamen, guerrilla conflicts amid the defiles of mountains, brave defenses of fortresses, dissensions and jealousies between chieftains, treacheries and cruelties equaling those of the Turks another aspect than the recovery of national independence even it is memorable for the complications which grew out of it especially for the war between turkey and russia when the emperor nicholas feeling that turkey was weakened and exhausted sought to grasp the prize which he had long coveted even the possessions of the sick man nicholas was the opposite of his brother alexander having neither his gentleness his impulsiveness his generosity nor his indecision he was a hard despot of the blood and iron stamp, ambitious for aggrandizement, indifferent to the sufferings of others, and withal a religious bigot. The Greek rebellion, as we have seen, gave him the occasion to pick a quarrel with the Sultan. The Danubian principalities were dearer to him than remote possessions on the Mediterranean. So, on the seventh day of May, 1828, the Russians crossed the Pruth and invaded Moldavia and Wallachia, provinces which had long belonged to Turkey by right of conquest, though governed by Greek hospodars. The Danube was crossed on the 7th of June. The Turks were in no condition to contend in the open field with 70,000 Russians, and they retreated to their fortresses, to Abrelia and Silistria on the Danube, to Varna and Shumla in the vicinity of the Balkans. The first few weeks of the war were marked by Russian successes. Abrelia capitulated on the 18th of June, and the military posts on the Dalbrashada fell rapidly one after another. But it was at Shumla that the strongest part of the Turkish army was concentrated, under Omar Baronis bent on defensive operations, and thither the Tsar directed his main attack. Before this stronghold, his army wasted away by sickness in the malarial month of September. The Turks were reinforced and moved to the relief of Varna, also invested by Russian troops. But the season was now too far advanced for military operations, and the Russians, after enormous losses, withdrew to the Danube to resume the offensive the following spring. The winter was spent in bringing up reserves. The Tsar, finding that he had no aptitude as a general, withdrew to his capital, entrusting the direction of the following campaign to Diebich, a Prussian general famous for his successes and his cruelties. In the spring of 1829 the first movement was made to seize Silistria, 
toward which a great Turkish force was advancing, under Reshid Pasha, the Grand Vizier. His forces experienced a great defeat, and two weeks after, in the latter part of June, Silistria surrendered. Resistance to the Russians was now difficult. The passes of the Balkans were left undefended, and the invading force easily penetrated them and advanced to Adrianople, which surrendered in a great panic. The Russians could have been defeated had not the Turks lost their senses, for the troops under Dibich were reduced to 20,000 men. But this fact was unknown to the Turks, who magnified the Russian forces to 100,000 at least. The result was the Treaty of Adrianople on the 14th of September, apparently generous to the Turks, but really of great advantage to the Russians. Russia restored to Turkey all her conquests in Europe and Asia, except a few commercial centers on the Black Sea, while the treaty gave to the Tsar the protectorate over the Danubian principalities, the exclusion of Turks from fortified posts on the left bank of the Danube, free passage through the Dardanelles to the merchant vessels of all nations at peace with the Sultan, and the free navigation of the Black Sea. But Constantinople still remained the capital of Turkey. The sick man would not die. From jealousy of Russia, the Western powers continued to nurse him. Without their aid he was not long to live, but his existence was deemed necessary to maintain the balance of power, and they came to his assistance in the Crimean War twenty-six years later, and gave him a new lease of life. This is the Eastern question. How long before the Turks will be driven out of Europe, and who shall possess Constantinople? That is a question upon which it would be idle for me to offer speculations. Another aspect of the question is, how far shall Russia be permitted to make conquests in the East? This is equally insoluble. Authorities Finley's Greece under Ottoman domination, Leek's travels in northern Greece, Gordon's Greek Revolution, Metternich's memoirs, Howe's Greek Revolution, Mendelssohn's Graf Capo Distris, Anne Hist Valentini, Allison's Europe, Fife's History of Modern Europe, Muller's Political History of Recent Times. End of section 18. Section 19 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 9, European Statesmen, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Louis Philippe, Part 1. 1773 to 1850, The Citizen King. A new phase in the development of French revolutionary history took place on the accession of Louis Philippe to the throne. He became King of the French instead of King of France. Louis the Eighteenth, upon his coming to the throne at Napoleon's downfall, would not consent to reign except by divine right, on principles of legitimacy, as the brother of Louis the Sixteenth. He felt that the throne was his by all the laws of succession. He would not, therefore, accept it as the gift of the French nation or of foreign powers. He consented to be fettered by a constitution as his brother had done, but that any power could legally give to him what he deemed was already his own was in his eyes an absurdity this was not the case with louis philippe for he was not the legitimate heir he belonged to a younger branch of the bourbons and could not be the legitimate king until all the male heirs of the elder branch were extinct and yet both branches of the royal family were the lineal descendants of henry the fourth this circumstance pointed him out as the proper person to ascend to the throne on the expulsion of the elder branch but he was virtually an elective sovereign chosen by the will of the nation so he became king not by divine right but by receiving the throne as the gift of the people there were other reasons why louis philippe was raised to the throne he was the duke of orleans the richest man in france son of that egalite who took part in the revolution avowing all its principles therefore he was supposed to be liberal in his sentiments the popular leaders who expelled charles v among the rest lafayette that idol of the united states that grandison cromwell as carlyle called him viewed the duke of orleans as the most available person to preserve order and law to gain the confidence of the country and to preserve the constitution which guaranteed personal liberty the freedom of the press the inviolability of the judiciary and the rights of electors to the chamber of deputies in which was vested the power of granting supplies to the executive government times were not ripe for a republic and only a few radicals wanted it the nation desired a settled government yet one ruling by the laws which the nation had decreed through its representatives 
louis philippe swore to everything that was demanded of him and was in all respects a constitutional monarch under whom the french expected all the rights and liberties that england enjoyed all this was a step in advance of the monarchy of louis the eighteenth louis philippe was rightly named the citizen king this monarch was also a wise popular and talented man he had passed through great vicissitudes of fortune at one time he taught a school in switzerland he was an exile and a wanderer from country to country he had learned much from his misfortunes he had had great experiences and was well read in the history of thrones and empires he was affable in his manners and interesting in conversation a polished gentleman with considerable native ability the intellectual equal of the statesmen who surrounded him his morals were unstained and his tastes were domestic his happiest hours were spent in the bosom of his family and his family was harmonious and respectable he was the idol of the middle classes bankers merchants lawyers and wealthy shopkeepers were his strongest supporters all classes acquiesced in the rule of a worthy man as he seemed to all moderate peace-loving benignant good-natured they did not see that he was selfish crafty money-loving bound up in family interests this plain-looking respectable middle-aged man as he walked under the colonnade of the rue de rivoli with an umbrella under his arm looked more like a plain citizen than a king the leading journals were all won over to his side the chamber of deputies by a large majority voted for him and the eighty-three departments representing thirty-five millions of people by a still larger majority elected him king the two chambers prepared a constitution which he unhesitatingly accepted and swore to maintain he was not chosen by universal suffrage but by one hundred and fifty thousand voters the republicans were not satisfied but submitted so also did the ultra royalists it was at first fear that the allied powers under the influence of metternich would be unfriendly yet one after another recognized the new government feeling that it was the best under the circumstances that could be established the man who had the most to do with the elevation of louis philippe was the marquis de lafayette who as far back as the first revolution was the commander of the national guards and they as the representatives of the middle classes sustained the throne during this reign lafayette had won great reputation for his magnanimous and chivalrous assistance to the united states when at twenty years of age he escaped from official hindrances at home and tendered his unpaid voluntary services to washington this was in the darkest period of the american revolution when washington had a pitifully small army and when the american treasury was empty lafayette was the friend and admirer of washington whose whole confidence he possessed and he not only performed distinguished military duty but within a year returned to france and secured a french fleet land forces clothing and ammunition for the struggling patriots as the result of french recognition of american independence and of a large treaty of alliance with the new american nation both largely due to his efforts and influence when lafayette departed on his return to france he was laden with honors and with the lasting gratitude of the american people he returned burning with enthusiasm for liberty and for american institutions and this passion for liberty was never quenched under whatever form of government existed in france he was from first to last the consistent friend of struggling patriots sincere honest incorruptible with horror of revolutionary excesses as sentimental as lamartine yet as firm as carnot lafayette took an active part in the popular movements in seventeen eighty seven and in seventeen eighty nine formed the national guard and gave it the tricolor badge but he was too consistent and steady-minded for the times he was not liked by extreme royalists or by extreme republicans he was denounced by both parties and had to flee the country to save his life driven from paris by the excesses of the reign of terror which he abhorred he fell into the hands of the prussians who delivered him to the austrians and by them he was immured in a dungeon at olmutz for three and a half years being finally released only by the influence of napoleon so rigorous was his captivity that none of his family or friends knew for two years where he was confined on his return from austria he lived in comparative retirement at lagrange his country seat and took no part in the government of napoleon whom he regarded as a traitor to the cause of liberty nor did he enter the service of the bourbons knowing their settled hostility to free institutions 
history says but little about him during this time except that from eighteen eighteen to eighteen twenty four he was a member of the chamber of deputies and in eighteen twenty five to eighteen thirty was again prominent in the legislative opposition to the royal government in eighteen thirty again as an old man he reappeared as commander-in-chief of the National Guards when Charles X was forced to abdicate. Lafayette now became the most popular man in France, and from him largely emanated the influences which replaced Charles X with Louis-Philippe. He was not a man of great abilities, but was generally respected as an honest man. He was most marked for practical sagacity and love of constitutional liberty. The phrase, a monarchical government surrounded with republican institutions, is ascribed to him an illogical expression which called out the sneers of carlyle whose sympathies were with strong governments and with the men who can rule and who therefore as he thought ought to rule lafayette was doubtless played with and used by louis philippe the most astute and crafty of monarchs professing the greatest love and esteem for the general who had elevated him the king was glad to get rid of him so too were the chambers the former from jealousy of his popularity and the latter from dislike of his independence and integrity under louis philippe he held no higher position than as a member of the chamber of deputies as deputy he had always been and continued to be fearless patriotic and sometimes eloquent his speeches were clear unimpassioned sensible and he was always listened to with respect he took great interest in the wrongs of all oppressed people and exiles from poland from spain and from italy found in him a generous protector his house was famous for its unpretending hospitalities especially to american travelers he lived long enough to see the complete triumph of american institutions in eighteen twenty four upon a formal invitation by congress he revisited the united states as the guest of the nation and received unprecedented ovations wherever he went a tribute of the heart such as only great benefactors enjoy when envy gives place to gratitude and admiration a great man he was not in the ordinary sense of greatness yet few men will live as long as he in the national hearts of two nations for character if not for genius for services if not for brilliant achievements the first business of the new monarch in eighteen thirty was to choose his ministers and he selected as premier lafitte the banker a prominent member of the chamber of deputies who had had great influence in calling him to the throne lafitte belonged to the liberal party and was next to lafayette the most popular man in france but superior to that statesman in intellect and executive ability he lived in grand style and his palace with its courts and gardens was the resort of the most distinguished men in france the duke of choiseul dupin beranger casimir perrier montalavie the two aragos guizot odillon barot via main politicians artists and men of letters his ministry however lasted less than a year the vast increase in the public expenditure aroused a storm of popular indignation the increase of taxation is always resented by the middle classes and by this measure lafitte lost his popularity moreover the public disorders lessened the authority of the government in march eighteen thirty one the king found it expedient to dismiss lafitte and appoint casimir perrier an abler man to succeed him lafitte was not great enough for the exigencies of the time his business was to make money and it was his pleasure to spend it but he was unable to repress the discontents of paris or to control the french revolutionary ideas which were spreading over the whole continent especially in belgium in which a revolution took place accompanied by a separation from holland Belgium was erected into an independent kingdom under a constitutional government. Prince Leopold of Saxe-Coburg, having refused the crown of Greece, was elected king, and shortly after married a daughter of Louis-Philippe, which marriage, of course, led to a close union between France and Belgium. In this marriage, the dynastic ambition of Louis-Philippe, which was one of the main causes of his subsequent downfall in 1848, became obvious but he had craft enough to hide his ambition under the guise of zeal for constitutional liberty casimir perrier was a man of great energy and liberal in his political antecedents a banker of immense wealth and great force of character reproachless in his integrity he had scarcely assumed office when he was called upon to enforce a very rigorous policy france was in a distracted state not so much from political agitation as from the discontent engendered by poverty and by the difficulty of finding work for operatives 
a state not unlike that of england before the passage of the reform bill according to louis blanc the public distress was appalling united with disgusting immorality among the laboring classes in country districts and in great manufacturing centers in consequence there were alarming riots at lyon and other cities the people were literally starving and it required great resolution and firmness on the part of the government to quiet the disorders lyon was in the hands of a mob and marshal soult was promptly sent with forty thousand regular troops to restore order in this public distress when laborers earned less than a shilling a day and when the unemployed exceeded in number those who found work on a wretched pittance was at its height when the chamber of deputies decreed a civil list for the king to the amount of nearly nineteen millions of francs thirty-seven times greater than that given to napoleon as first consul and this too when the king's private income was six millions of francs a year such was the disordered state of the country that the prime minister whose general policy was that of peace sent a military expedition into ancona in the papal territories merely to divert the public mind from the disorders which reigned throughout the land indeed the earlier years of the reign of louis philippe were so beset with difficulties that it required extraordinary tact prudence and energy to govern it all but the king was equal to the emergency he showed courage and good sense and preserved his throne at the same time while he suppressed disorders by vigorous measures he took care to strengthen his power he was in harmony with the chamber of deputies composed almost entirely of rich men the liberal party demanded an extension of the suffrage to which he gracefully yielded and the number of electors was raised to one hundred and eighty thousand but extended only to those who paid a direct tax of two hundred francs a bill was also passed in the chamber of deputies abolishing hereditary peerage though opposed by guizot thiers and Berrier of course the opposition in the upper house was great and thirty-six new peers were created to carry the measure the year eighteen thirty two was marked by the ravages of the cholera which swept away twenty thousand people in paris alone and among them casimir perrier and cuvier the pride of the scientific world but louis philippe was not yet firmly established on his throne his ministers had suppressed disorders seized two hundred journals abolished hereditary peerage extended the electoral suffrage while he had married his daughter to the king of belgium he now began to consolidate his power by increasing the army seeking alliances with the different powers of europe bribing the press and enriching his subordinates taxation was necessarily increased yet renewed prosperity from the increase of industries removed discontents which arise not from the excess of burdens but from a sense of injustice now began the millennium of shopkeepers and bankers all of whom supported the throne the chamber of deputies granted the government all the money it wanted which was lavishly spent in every form of corruption and luxury again set in never were the shops more brilliant or equipages more gorgeous the king on his accession had removed from the palace which cardinal mazarin had bequeathed to louis fourteenth and took up his residence at the tuileries and though his own manners were plain he surrounded himself with all the pomp of royalty but not with the old courtiers of charles the tenth marshal soul greatly distinguished himself in suppressing disorders especially a second riot in lyon to add to the public disorders the duchess of berry made a hostile descent on france with the vain hope of restoring the elder branch of the bourbons this unsuccessful movement was easily put down and the discredited princess was arrested and imprisoned meanwhile the popular discontents continued and a fresh insurrection broke out in paris headed by republican chieftains the republicans were disappointed and disliked the vigor of the government which gave indications of a sterner rule than that of charles x moreover the laboring classes found themselves unemployed the government of louis philippe was not for them but for the bourgeois party shopkeepers bankers and merchants the funeral of general lamarck a popular favorite was made the occasion of fresh disturbances which at one time were quite serious the old cry of vive la république began to be heard from thousands of voices in the scenes of former insurrections revolt assumed form a mysterious meeting was held at lafitte's when the dethronement of the king was discussed the mob was already in possession of one of the principal quarters of the city the authorities were greatly alarmed but they had taken vigorous measures there were eighteen thousand regular troops under arms with eighty pieces of cannon and thirty thousand more in the environs beside the national guards what could the students of the polytechnic school and an undisciplined mob do against these armed troops in vain their cries of vive la liberté abbas louis philippe 
the military school was closed and the leading journals of the republican party were seized marshal sol found himself on the seventh of june eighteen thirty two at the head of sixty thousand regular troops and twenty thousand national guards the insurgents who had erected barricades were driven back after a fierce fight at the cloister of st marie this bloody triumph closed the insurrection the throne of the citizen king was saved by the courage and discipline of the regular troops under a consummate general the throne of charles x could not have stood a day in face of such an insurrection the next day after the defeat of the insurgents paris was proclaimed in a state of siege in spite of the remonstrances of all parties against it as an unnecessary act but the king was firm and indignant and ordered the arrest of both democrats and legitimists including garnier paget and chateaubriand himself he made war on the press during his reign of two years two hundred and eighty-one journals were seized and fines imposed to nearly the amount of four hundred thousand francs the suppression of revolts in both paris and lyon did much to strengthen the government and the result was an increase of public prosperity capital reappeared from its hiding places and industry renewed its labors the public funds rose six per cent the first dawn of the welfare of the laboring classes rose on their defeat for his great services in establishing a firm government marshal salt was made prime minister with de broglie guizot and thiers among his associates the chief event which marked his administration was a war with holland followed by the celebrated siege of antwerp which the hollanders occupied with a large body of troops england joined with france in this contest which threatened to bring on a general european war but the successful capture of the citadel of antwerp after a gallant defence prevented that catastrophe this successful siege vastly increased the military prestige of france and brought belgium completely under french influence End of section 19. Section 20 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 9, European Statesmen, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Louis Philippe, Part 2. The remaining events which marked the ministry of Marshal Soult were the project of fortifying Paris by a series of detached forts of great strength entirely surrounding the city the liberal expenditure of money for public improvements, and the maintenance of the colony of Algeria. The first measure was postponed on account of the violent opposition of the Republicans, and the second was carried out with popular favor through the influence of Thiers. The Arc de l'Etoile was finished at an expense of two million francs, the Church of the Madeleine at a cost of nearly three millions, the Pantheon of one million four hundred thousand, the Museum of Natural History, for which 2,400,000 francs were appropriated, the Church of St. Denis, 1,350,000, the École des Beaux-Arts, 1,900,000, the Hôtel du Croix Orsay, 3,450,000, besides other improvements, the chief of which was in canals, for which 44 millions of francs were appropriated, altogether nearly 100 millions of francs, which of course furnished employment for discontented laborers the retention of the colony of algeria resulted in improving the military strength of france especially by the institution of the corps of zouaves which afterward furnished effective soldiers it was in africa that the ablest generals of louis napoleon were trained for the crimean war in eighteen thirty four marshal soult retired from the ministry and a series of prime ministers rapidly succeeded one another some of whom were able and of high character but no one of whom made any great historical mark until thiers took the helm of the government in eighteen thirty six not like a modern english prime minister who is supreme so long as he is supported by parliament but rather as the servant of the king like the ministers of george the third thiers was forty years of age when he became prime minister although for years he had been a conspicuous and influential member of the chamber of deputies like guizot he sprang from the people his father being an obscure locksmith in marseilles like Guizot, he first became distinguished as a writer for the Constitutional, and afterwards as its editor. He was a brilliant and fluent speaker, at home on all questions of the day, always equal to the occasion, yet without striking originality or profundity of views. Like most men who have been the architects of their own fortunes, he was vain and consequential. He was liberal in his views, a friend of order and law, with aristocratic tendencies he was more warlike in his policy than suited either the king or his rival guizot who had entered the cabinet with him on the death of casimir perrier 
nor was he a favorite with louis philippe who was always afraid that he would embroil the kingdom in war thiers political opinions were very much like those of canning in later days his genius was versatile he wrote history in the midst of his oratorical triumphs his history of the french revolution was by far the ablest and most trustworthy that had yet appeared the same may be said of his history of the consulate and of the empire he was a great admirer of napoleon and did more than any other to perpetuate the emperor's fame his labors were prodigious he rose at four in the morning and wrote thirty or forty letters before breakfast he was equally remarkable as an administrator and as a statesman examining all the details of government and leaving nothing to chance no man in france knew the condition of the country so well as thiers from both a civil and a military point of view he was overbearing in the chamber of deputies and hence was not popular with the members he was prime minister several times but rarely for more than a few months at a time the king always got rid of him as soon as he could and much preferred guizot the high priest of the doctrinaires whose policy was like that of lord aberdeen in england peace at any price nothing memorable happened during the short administration of thiers except the agitation produced by secret societies in switzerland composed of refugees from all nations who kept europe in constant alarm there were the young italy society and the societies of young poland young germany young france and young switzerland the cabinets of europe took alarm and thiers brought matters to a crisis by causing the french minister at Bern to intimate to the swiss government that unless these societies were suppressed all diplomatic intercourse would cease between france and switzerland which meant an armed intervention this question of the expulsion of political refugees drew metternich and thiers into close connection but a still more important question as to the intervention in spanish matters brought about a difference between the king and his minister in consequence of which the latter resigned count mole now took the premiership retaining it for two years he was a grave laborious and thoughtful man but without the genius eloquence and versatility of thiers mole belonged to an ancient and noble family and his splendid chateau was filled with historical monuments he had all the affability of manners which marked the man of high birth without their frivolity one of the first acts of his administration was the liberation of political prisoners among whom was the famous prince polianac the prime minister of charles the tenth the old king himself died about the same time in exile in a foreign land the year eighteen thirty six was also signalized by the foolish and unsuccessful attempt of louis napoleon at strasbourg to overthrow the government but he was humanely and leniently dealt with suffering no greater punishment than banishment to the united states for ten years in the following year occurred the marriage of the duke of orleans heir to the throne with a german princess of the lutheran faith followed by magnificent festivities soon after took place the inauguration of the palace of versailles as a museum of fine arts which as such has remained to this day nor did louis napoleon in the height of his power venture to use this ancient and magnificent residence of the kings of france for any other purpose but the most important event in the administration of count mole was the extension of the algerian colony to the limits of the ancient libya so long the granary of imperial rome and which once could boast of twenty millions of people this occupation of african territory led to the war in which the celebrated arab chieftain abed el kader was the hero he was both priest and warrior enjoying the unlimited confidence of his countrymen and by his cunning and knowledge of the country he succeeded in maintaining himself for several years against the french generals his stronghold was constantine which was taken by storm in october eighteen thirty seven by general valet still the arab chieftain found means to defy his enemies and it was not until eighteen forty one that he was forced to flee and seek protection from the emperor of morocco the storming of constantine was a notable military exploit and gave great prestige to the government louis philippe was now firmly established on his throne yet he had narrowly escaped assassination four or five times this taught him to be cautious and to realize the fact that no monarch can be safe amid the plots of fanatics he no longer walked the streets of paris with an umbrella under his arm but enshrouded himself in the tuileries with the usual guards of continental kings his favorite residence was at st cloud at that time one of the most beautiful of the royal palaces of europe at this time the railway mania raged in france as it did in england foremost among those who undertook to manage the great corporations which had established district railways was arago the astronomer who although a zealous republican was ever listened to with respect in the chamber of deputies 
these railways indicated great material prosperity in the nation at large and the golden age of speculators and capitalists set in all adverse to war all worshippers of money all for peace at any price morning noon and night the offices of bankers and stock jobbers were besieged by files of carriages and clamorous crowds even by ladies of rank to purchase shares in companies which were to make everybody's fortune and which at one time had risen fifteen hundred per cent giving opportunities for boundless frauds military glory for a time ceased to be a passion among the most excitable and warlike people of europe and gave way to the more absorbing passion for gain and for the pleasures which money purchases nor was it difficult in this universal pursuit of sudden wealth to govern a nation whose rulers had the appointment of one hundred and forty thousand civil officers and an army of four hundred thousand men bribery and corruption kept pace with material prosperity never before had officials been so generally and easily bribed indeed the government was built up on this miserable foundation with bribery corruption and sudden wealth the most shameful immorality existed everywhere out of every one thousand births one-third were illegitimate the theatres were disgraced by the most indecent plays money and pleasure had become the gods of france and paris more than ever before was the centre of luxury and social vice it was at this period of peace and tranquillity that talleyrand died on the seventeenth of may eighteen thirty eight at eighty two after serving in his advanced age louis philippe as an ambassador at london the abbe dupanloup afterward bishop of orleans administered the last services of his church to the dying statesman talleyrand had however outlived his reputation which was at its height when he went to the congress of vienna in eighteen fourteen though he rendered great services to the different sovereigns whom he served he was too selfish and immoral to obtain a place in the hearts of the nation a man who had sworn fidelity to thirteen constitutions and betrayed them all could not be much mourned or regretted at his death his fame was built on witty sayings elegant manners and adroit adaptation to changing circumstances rather than on those solid merits which alone extort the respect of posterity the ministry of count Molay was not eventful it was marked chiefly for the dissensions of political parties troubles in belgium and threatened insurrections which alarmed the bourgeoisie the king feeling the necessity for a still stronger government recalled old marshal soul to the head of affairs neither thiers nor guizot formed part of soul's cabinet on account of their mutual jealousies and undisguised ambition both aspiring to lead and unwilling to accept any office short of the premiership another great man now came into public notice this was viamain who was made minister of public instruction a post which guizot had previously filled viamain was a peer of france an aristocrat from his connections with high society but a liberal from his love of popularity he was one of the greatest writers of this period both in history and philosophy and an advocate of polish independence thiers at this time was the recognized leader of the left and left centre in the deputies while his rival guizot was the leader of the conservatives eastern affairs now assumed great prominence in the chamber of deputies turkey was reduced to the last straits in consequence of the victories of ibrahim pasha in asia minor france and england adhered to the policy of non-intervention and the sultan in his despair was obliged to invoke the aid of his most dangerous ally russia who extorted as the price of his assistance the famous treaty of unkiar skeldesi which excluded all the ships of war except those of russia and turkey from the black sea the effect of which was to make it a muscovite lake england and france did not fully perceive their mistake in thus throwing turkey into the arms of russia by their eagerness to maintain the status quo the policy of austria there were however a few statesmen in the french chamber of deputies who deplored the inaction of government among these was lamartine who made a brilliant and powerful speech against an inglorious peace this orator was now in the height of his fame and but for his excessive vanity and sentimentalism might have reached the foremost rank in the national councils he was distinguished not only for eloquence but for his historical compositions which are brilliant and suggestive but rather prolix and discursive sir archibald allison seems to think that lamartine cannot be numbered among the great historians since like the classic historians of greece and rome he has not given authorities for his statements and unlike german writers disdains footnotes as pedantic but i observe that in his history of europe allison quotes lamartine oftener than any other french writer and evidently admires his genius and throws no doubt on the general fidelity of his works 
a partisan historian full of prejudices like macaulay with all his prodigality of references is apt to be in reality more untruthful than a dispassionate writer without any show of learning at all the learning of an advocate may hide an obscure truth as well as illustrate it it is doubtless the custom of historical writers generally to enrich or burden their works with all the references they can find to the delight of critics who glory in dullness but this after all may be a mere scholastic fashion lamartine probably preferred to embody his learning in the text than display it in footnotes moreover he did not write for critics but for the people not for the few but for the many as a popular writer his histories like those of voltaire had an enormous sale if he were less rhetorical and discursive his books perhaps would have more merit he fatigues by the redundancy of his riches and the length of his sentences and yet he is as candid and judicial as hallam and would have had the credit of being so had he only taken more pains to prove his points by stating his authorities next to the insolvable difficulties which attended the discussion of the eastern question whether turkey should be suffered to crumble away without the assistance of the western powers whether russia should be driven back from the black sea or not the affairs of africa excited great interest in the chambers algiers had been taken by french armies under the bourbons and a colony had been founded in countries of great natural fertility it was now a question how far the french armies should pursue their conquests in africa involving an immense expenditure of men and money in order to found a great colonial empire and gain military eclat so necessary in france to give strength to any government but a new insurrection and confederation of the defeated arab tribes marked by all the fanaticism of moslem warriors made it necessary for the french to follow up their successes with all the vigor possible in consequence an army of forty thousand infantry and twelve thousand cavalry and artillery drove the arabs in eighteen forty to their remotest fastnesses the ablest advocate for war measures was thiers and so formidable were his eloquence and influence in the chambers that he was again called to the head of affairs and his second administration took place the rivalry and jealousy between this great statesman and guizot would not permit the latter to take a subordinate position but he was mollified by the appointment of ambassador to london the prime minister had a great majority to back him and such was his ascendancy that he had all things his own way for a time in spite of the king whose position was wittily set forth in a famous expression of thiers le roi regne et ne gouverneur pas still in spite of the liberal and progressive views of thiers very little was done toward the amelioration of the sufferings of the people for whom personally he cared but little true a bill was introduced into the chambers which reduced the hours of labor in the manufactories from twelve to eight hours and from sixteen hours to twelve while it forbade the employment of children under eight years of age in the mills but this beneficent measure though carried in the chamber of peers was defeated in the lower house made up of capitalists and parsimonious money worshippers what excited the most interest in the short administration of thiers was the removal of the bones of napoleon from saint helena to the banks of the seine which he loved so well and their deposition under the dome of the invalides the proudest monument of louis quatorze louis philippe sent his son the prince de joinville to superintend this removal an act of magnanimity hard to be reconciled with his usual astuteness and selfishness he probably thought that his throne was so firmly established that he could afford to please the enemies of his house and perhaps would gain popularity but such a measure doubtless kept alive the memory of the deeds of the great conqueror and renewed sentiments in the nation in which less than ten years afterward facilitated the usurpation of his nephew in fact the bones of napoleon were scarcely removed to their present resting-place before louis napoleon embarked upon his rash expedition at boulogne was taken prisoner and immured in the fortress of ham where he spent six years in strict seclusion conversing only with books until he contrived to escape to england the eastern question again under thiers's administration became the great topic of conversation and public interest and his military policy came near embroiling france in war so great was the public alarm that the army was raised to four hundred thousand men and measures were taken to adopt a great system of fortifications around paris it was far however from the wishes and policies of the king to be dragged into war by an ambitious and restless minister he accordingly summoned guizot from london to meet him privately at the chateau d'eau in normandy where the statesman fully expounded his conservative and pacific policy 
the result of this interview was the withdrawal of the french forces in the levant and the dismissal of thiers who had brought the nation to the edge of war his place was taken by guizot who henceforth with brief intervals was the ruling spirit in the councils of the king guizot on the whole was the greatest name connected with the reign of louis philippe although his elevation to the premiership was long delayed in solid learning political ability and parliamentary eloquence he had no equal unless it were thiers he was a native of switzerland and a protestant but all his tendencies were conservative he was cold and austere in manners and character he had acquired distinction in the two preceding reigns both as a political writer for the journals and as a historian the extreme left and the extreme right called him a doctrinaire and he was never popular with either of these parties he greatly admired the english constitution and attempted to steer a middle course being the advocate of constitutional monarchy surrounded with liberal institutions amid the fierce conflict of parties which marked the reign of louis philippe guizot gradually became more and more conservative verging on absolutism hence he broke with lafayette who was always ready to upset the throne when it encroached on the liberties of the people his policy was pacific while thiers was always involving the nation in military schemes in the latter part of the reign of louis philippe guizot's view were not dissimilar to those of the english tories his studies led him to detest war as much as did lord aberdeen and he was the invariable advocate of peace he was like thiers an aristocrat at heart although sprung from the middle classes he was simple in his habits and style of life and was greater as a philosopher than as a practical statesman amid popular discontents End of section twenty.